everyone. We're going to talk about uh, Exodus, um, the Yitziat Mitzrayim, and Chippazon, the speed with which it happened. We want to know what was the hurry? Why was there such a tearing hurry? Why did they need to rush out of Egypt? That's by way of introduction. Here I am um, in Beverly Hills at home, not able to get out. Uh, but uh, we're all anticipating Yitzias Mitzrayim. We're all anticipating Pesach, which is just three weeks away tonight. And therefore, by way of introduction, in this, the first share of a series that I'm going to give with regards to Pesach, we're going to broadcast them live. We're going to be talking about Chippazon. So let's begin. The Haggadah says, Matzah zu al shumma. Why do we have matzah on Seder night? What is it about Seder night that requires eating matzah? The reason that we give in the Haggadah is that our forefathers, their dough that they made as they were about to leave Egypt, did not have enough time to rise before God had revealed himself and that they had been freed. So they put the dough together, they mixed the flour, flour and they mixed it with water, whatever it is that they did. The dough didn't have time to rise. And therefore, the bread that they baked became matzah, became this kind of cracker bread um, without any air in it. And that's why we have matzah on Seder night. The actual phrase that is used in the Haggadah is melech malche hamalachim. The dough didn't rise before melech malche hamalachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, had revealed himself and they were redeemed. So the first question we're going to deal with today is why specifically here, with reference to the bread uh, that didn't rise, the dough that didn't rise, is God referred to using this uh, terminology of melech malche hamlachim? Why can't we just call him Hashem? Why can't we just call him Elohim? Why is he called melech malche hamlachim, which means the king of all kings? I want to uh, just digress for a minute. I want to tell you a, a little story I once heard. I'm not sure that this is the correct name. But the name I have is Chizkia ben Aaron. He was one of, I don't know if you know, in July of 1976, there, were, there was an Air France plane which was diverted and taken to Entebbe uh, in Uganda. And there was a daring rescue. And in fact, the brother of Israel's current prime minister, Yonatan Netanyahu, who's Bibi Netanyahu's brother, was killed. He was the only person who was killed in this daring rescue of the, of the uh, Israeli military. They, took the hostages and they managed to bring them out, bring them back into freedom. It was a, an unbelievable event that took place around July 4th of 1976. Anyway, Chizkia ben Aaron was one of the um, Entebbe hostages. He was on the Air France plane in 1976 that was hijacked and brought to Entebbe. And on the night of the famous rescue by the Israeli special forces, Chizkia was sleeping there, whatever it was, in the hangar or the terminal of the old airport at Entebbe. And he was sleeping in the terminal and he had taken off the belt from his pants. And when he was woken up and they started rushing them out of the terminal building to take them to the, to the aircraft that was going to bring them to freedom, he was told to start moving and the terminal was pitch black and he looked around, he scrabbled around next to where he was sleeping and he couldn't find his belt. So he had to run off without it. He was holding onto his pants. So he didn't want his pants to fall down. He had no choice because he, he had to be freed. He had to be rescued. Anyway, the following year and every year since, when I heard this story about 10 years ago, I don't know, um, I don't know what's been happening since then. I don't even know if he's still alive. But Chizkib and Aaron had a party the following year and he's had one every single year since for all his friends and his family. And in honor of this anniversary, he asks all his friends to bring him a belt and they have a big fire in the backyard of his house and he burns all the belts. That's the way he commemorates the rescue from Entebbe. And he refers to this day, uh, this anniversary day, as the Yom HaChagura, the day of the belts. Frankly, this whole focus on the belt, I mean, it's a cute story, but it's a bit ridiculous because this guy seems to be focusing on a quite superfluous aspect of the day. I mean, think about it. The man's life was at risk. He was threatened with almost certain death. And he was rescued 
and thankfully he survived this, or, this ordeal and he's now alive. What is he celebrating? The fact that he managed to keep his pants as he ran off from Entebbe Airport. He's turning this into the central theme of the anniversary of the day that he was rescued by Israel's um, special forces. I mean, come on, this was the day his life was saved. Who cares about a silly belt? We're gonna come back to Chizkiah ben Aram. But with that in mind, we know that when we name something, it's a clear indication of what is important. But when we give something a name, any anniversary, for example, we just mentioned July 4th. July 4th in the American calendar is called Independence Day. Why? Because it is the day when the uh, people in the colonies made, the, made themselves independent from the British. So it's called Independence Day all the way through to now. Doesn't matter, it's uh, more than almost 250 years later. It's still called Independence Day because that day is special because it's the day that we became independent. The name the Torah gives Pesach is Chag Hamatzot. I mean, come on, what, what type of name is that? We've just heard that the reason we ate matzahs is because the dough didn't have time to rise before God revealed himself and that they were freed. But it was God revealing himself and the freedom that was the point, not the silly dough. Who cares about the dough? It's like we just laughed at Chizkiah ben Aaron calling the day that he was rescued from Entebbe, Yom HaChagura. How are we any different? If we call Pesach Chag HaMatzot, instead of calling it the Chag when we were revealed as the Jewish nation, the Chag when we encountered God, why are we calling it Chag HaMatzot? So this is the second question. First question, remember, was Melech Malchei Amlachi. The second question we're going to deal with today is, are the matzahs really the primary factor of our exodus from Egypt? What difference does it make what we ate or did not eat when we left Egypt? Like Chizkiah's belt at Entebbe, it seems that the matzah is a complete irrelevance. Why is it the name of the Chag? Why is it the name of the festival? Why is it such a central theme for Pesach? Okay, now I'm going to read through the psukim that describe our exodus from Egypt. It can be found in Shemot, chapter 12, you'd bet. It was midnight that night. God smote all the firstborns in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who sat on his throne, through to the firstborn of the prisoners sitting in the dungeon, and all the firstborn cattle. And the pasuk continues, Pharaoh got up that night, and all his servants, and the entire Egyptian population. And there was a great outcry, a screaming, a shouting in the land of Egypt. There was not a house in which somebody hadn't died. And Pharaoh called to Moshe Laharan and his brother Aaron. Laila, it's in the middle of the night, and he said, Kumu tzu mitoch ami. Get up and leave this country. Get out from among my nation. Go out. Gam atem, gam bnei Yisrael, ulechu ibdu et Hashem kedaberchem. You should go, and the Jewish nation should go, and you go and worship God as you said. Gam tzonechem. Your sheep, Gambakarchem, don't forget these were all things that he refused to consider even a few hours, a couple of days earlier. He had refused to consider letting the Jewish people go and certainly not their cattle and their sheep. But he said, Take it all. Take them as you said. Go and in your prayers make sure to bless me as well. And the Egyptians pressurized the people. 
למהר לשלחם מן הארץ, to speed them up, to hurry them, to leave the land, כי אמרו כולנו מתים, because they said, we're all going to die. וישא העמת בצקו, טרם יחמץ, and the people took their dough before it was leavened, משערותם צרורות בשמלותם על שכמם, their kneading troughs bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. That is, that is the um, psukim, those are the psukim, dealing with the actual moment of the exodus. It was at midnight, Pharaoh awoke, his own child had died, all the children in Egypt were dead, and he rushed the Jewish people out of Egypt. One more quote. This one is from chapter 16 in Shemot. Lo tochal alav chametz. You should not eat leavened bread together with the Korban Pesach, Shivat yamim tochal alav matzot. For seven days you should eat matzah. Lechem oni, it is the bread of affliction. Ki v'chipazon yatsata me'eretz mitzrayim. Because you emerged out of Egypt in great haste. The word chipazon, in a great hurry. Leman tizkor et yom tzedcha me'eretz mitzrayim kol yumei chayecha. So that you, that you may remember the day that you left Egypt all the days of your life. So I have a third question. We've asked two questions already. I want to ask you a third question. There seems to be nothing in Jewish history that was planned in greater detail than the exodus from Egypt. Hundreds of years earlier, before any of this happened, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were informed of the slavery and subsequent redemption. Every detail was foretold, but it seems that at the last minute, the whole thing turned into complete and utter chaos. Rather than a dignified exit from Egypt, the Jews were rushed out of Egypt in the middle of the night without even a chance to let their dough rise. Why was the redemption so rushed? Why was it so disorganized? What was the reason for the haste? What was the reason for the hurry? Couldn't God have given us a few more hours or even days so that we could get out of Egypt in an organized, dignified manner? Surely, another day, give them 24 hours, pack your things up, and then you can go. You know, in Shemot, in chapter 12, in the Pasuk Yudzain, it says as follows, Ushmartem et hamatzot. You should guard the matzahs. By the way, that's where the word Shmura comes from Shmura Matzah. You've heard of Shmura Matzah. The word Shmura comes from this Pasuk. Ushmartem et matzot. You should guard the Matzot. So Rashi says that this means that one should ensure that the Matzah does not have any possibility of becoming Chametz. So too, it doesn't have any possibility of becoming Chametz. In other words, while it is being prepared, one should make sure that it is done as quickly as possible to prevent any chance of it turning into chametz. Rashi also quotes, in the same Rashi, you look it up, he quotes Rav Yoshia, who says that the word matzot can also be read as, think about what the letters of the word matzot, mem, sadi, vav, and taf. Spells a similar word, mitzvot. Matzot and mitzvot use the same Hebrew letters. So Yeshia says that actually the word matzot can be re read mitzvot, just as one should be careful about the matzot, and that they don't have any opportunity to become chametz, so too one should ma always make sure not to let mitzvot turn into chametz. In other words, one should do the mitzvah immediately when it comes to hand. I'm going to quote it to you. Listen carefully to what, what uh, the quotation is from Chazal. Mitzvah haba'al yadcha, a mitzvah that comes to your hand, al tachmitzena, from the same word, chametz. Don't allow it to turn into chametz. Don't let it go. Don't let it slip through your fingers. Don't let it become old. Do it right away. Al Now, 
this uh, quite cryptic and cute derivation is explained by the Maharal in his commentary on Rashi. His commentary, the Maharal's commentary is called Gur Arye. The Torah could simply have said, Tishmeru mi chametz. If I wanted to tell you that you should be careful never to allow chametz to come into contact with anything, could say, Tishmeru mi chametz. Be careful that the matzah doesn't turn into chametz. Why does the Torah use this very strange formulation of Ushmartem et hamatzot? You should guard the matzot. And the reason is, says the Maharal, so that we have this interchange, this ambiguity with the word matzot, that it can also be read as the word mitzvot, to let you know that zurizut, speed, haste, doing something in a hurry in the performance of a mitzvah is a very good thing. And the practical application of this can be found with the mitzvah of Brit Milah. What's the mitzvah of Brit Milah? On the eighth day, you have to make sure to circumcise your son. So when do you do it? I mean, we've all been to a Brit. When do we do the Brit Milah? First thing in the morning. Why do we do it first thing in the morning? The reason we do it first thing in the morning is because we want to be Zuri Zim. We want to make sure, have mitzvah, baliyadcha, al tachmitsena. Don't allow the mitzvah to become chametz. You could do it in the afternoon. It's also the eighth day. Nothing wrong with doing Brit Milah in the afternoon. If you had to, by the way, you should do it in the afternoon. If the mile isn't available until later in the day, of course you can only do it then because we're not a mohel. However, if a mitzvah comes to your hand and you're able to do it, al tachmit sena, you should do it right away. Rav Yitzhak Hutner, in his Sefer Pachad Yitzchak explains that Rabbi Shia's derivation explicitly means that in the same way as matzot must be prepared bizrizut, otherwise they might become chametz, so too any mitzvah must be done quickly, immediately, without any delay, so that they don't become, as it were, chametz. It is not an enhanced way of doing it, to do it quickly. If you don't do it immediately, you're actually potentially spoiling the mitzvah, just like dough rising ruins the matzah. But why? Truthfully, let's think about it. Why? If a mitzvah is going to get done anyway, who cares if it was done later? Why does it really matter? Why, why is it so important? How can you compare a matzah, which actually does get ruined, the dough will get ruined if you let it rise. It won't be able to be matzah. How can you compare that to a mitzvah, which is done properly only two, three, four hours later or the next day? Even if it is done late, the mitzvah gets done. Doesn't mean it's not done. There must be a reason that fits both with matzah and mitzvot that actually makes sense. Something is not just a cute idea if it's presented um, to us by Chazal. It has to have meaning. I always say this, if something doesn't have meaning, then it doesn't mean anything. If it's true to say, mitzvah habali yadcha, al tachmit sena, it has to have real meaning. Doing the mitzvah earlier rather than later has to have real practical implications in terms of our spiritual connection to God. It can't just be a cute word comparison. So the Maral says, firstly, there are two aspects of the matzah which are worth noting. Firstly, that it cannot be chametz. That's the first thing you need to know about matzah. It's not allowed to be chametz. And secondly, that it must be made quickly so that it cannot become chametz. There's two things here. First of all, it can't be chametz. A physical state of the matzah cannot be chametz. And the second thing is that it cannot, it has to be made quickly in order for it not to become chametz. The reason that the Torah mandated this second aspect has another underlying cause. The Melech Malachi Hamlachim himself, the king of all kings himself, was involved in the miracle. And for the king of kings, there is no waiting. There's no time lapse. It gets done right away. There is no chance of chimutz. And to commemorate this, we must ensure speed with regard to the matzah baking so that no chance of chimutz is possible. Just like God's actions 
on the night of the redemption. Remember, it wasn't Kachatzi Halayla, it was Bachatzi Halayla, exactly at the stroke of midnight. That's when it happened. That's when redemption happened. It didn't even take a second. No time elapsed. Every mitzvah that comes your way, time and timing are of great importance. Nothing should interfere with the performance of a mitzvah. It must be done immediately. A mitzvah cannot be like ordinary stuff, bound by time, bound by the laws of physics. A mitzvah has to be supernatural, outside of the boundaries of ordinary natural law. It follows that if one does not do a mitzvah quickly, it somehow will become contaminated by time. So the fourth question is, based on what we just heard from the Maharal and the lead up to that, what is it about the passing of time that contaminates a mitzvah? Why is it that time will contaminate a mitzvah? We understand that God is beyond time and space, but what is it about time in our physical world that is going to contaminate a mitzvah to the extent that we say, mitzvah habali yadcha al tach mitzena? Okay, I'm going to have another digression. The Maral says that while the death of a true tzaddik is a huge loss for those he's left behind, for the tzaddik, it can be considered quite a positive thing because on this world, he or she, at the, she's going to be at the highest, go, he or she is going to be at the highest spiritual level that a human being can ever reach. But nonetheless, they are prevented at some level from the full realization of spiritual existence because they are held here in time and space. They have a body and they're bound by the time and the physics of their life. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses himself, who communicated with God Panim El Panim, as we said in last week's parish in Kitisa, was not on the ultimate level of spirituality, that it is possible to be in the ultimate world of truth. A true tzaddik is worthy of such a status, but can only ever achieve it after they've died. And he or she therefore covets, in some respect, will covet Olam Haba, the afterlife. But why is it that a tzaddik can't realize their full spiritual interaction with God in this world? What is it that's holding them back? Why is it only possible in Olam Abba? The Maral says in several places that the physical world acts like a curtain between us and God. It acts as a separation between humanity, sentient humans, and the divine presence. So the fifth question I want to ask is how exactly does the physical world function as a curtain, as a separation between humanity and God? So I've asked you five questions. I'm not gonna go over them, but we will answer them in sequence, starting with question number five. But in order to answer all of these five questions, we're going to have to deal with a central reality of the physical world and understand it in terms of Jewish tradition. And this is all found in the writings of the great Kabbalists. And this central reality is the existence of something which we refer to as time. Time is something which is unique to physical creation as opposed to the spiritual realm. Let us begin with two important Pesukim verses in Bereshit, in Genesis, that prophesy about the Egyptian exile. So in chapter 15 of Bereshit, God tells Avram, as he was known then, he wasn't yet Abraham, he was just Avram, You can be certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And shall serve them in that land. And they shall afflict them for 400 years. Note that, 400 years. The Gametagoi Asher Avodu, and also the nation I will judge, the nation that enslaves them I will judge, Dan Anochi, the Achre Kain, Yetzu Bir Chushkadol, and afterwards your descendants will come out of the land, wherever it is, not specified here as Egypt, will come out with great wealth. And continues the pasuk, 
ואתה תבוא אל אבותיך בשלום, and you will go to your fathers in peace, תיקבר בשיבה טובה, you will be buried in a good, ripe old age. And now, listen to this pasuk. ודור רביעי ישובו הנה. And the fourth generation of your descendants shall return here. So I want to ask you a question. In the first pasuk I quoted, what was the time span that was given? 400 years. What's the time span that we just heard in the last pasuk I quoted? Four generations. So which is it? Is it 400 years? Or is it four generations? I mean, stick with the theme, people. We're either going to have 400 years or we're going to have four generations. Which one is it? Why does the pasuk change in its definition of the time span that will elapse during the course of the um, enslavement in the unknown as yet land, which was, as it turned out, the land of Egypt? I want to quote something to you from the Vilna Gaon. It is stunning. It's absolutely remarkable. Listen carefully. Destruction is determined by time, but correction is determined by humans. I'm going to say it again. Beautiful. Destruction is determined by time. Correction is determined by humans. This exact idea is beautifully reflected in the division of mitzvot in the Torah. Think about this, it's just so beautiful. There are 248 positive commandments. Do this, do that, whatever the, the commandments are. And there's 365 negative commandments. Don't do this, don't do that, etc. The Gemara in Makot, the uh, Gemara is in Chaf Gimel, Daf uh, Omad Beis, Daf Chaf Gimel, Omad Beis, 23b. Rav Simloi learned as follows. Rav Simloi was a great darshan, quoted a few times across the Talmud. And he is the one who delivered to us this information about the 630 mitzvot and their division. Moshe was given 630 mitzvot. That's what the Torah contains. 365 negative commandments corresponding to the days of the solar calendar, the solar year, and 248 positive mitzvot, positive commandments, corresponding to the individual moving parts of the human body. What did the Vilna Gaon say? Destruction is determined by time, but correction is determined by humans. In other words, negative commandments, which represent destruction, don't do this, don't do that, or it's bad, correspond to the passing of time. Positive commandments, which is the same as they represent correction, what do they correspond to? To the actions of a human being, to the parts of the human body. The passing of time is negative, but the constructive actions of man are positive. The Vulnagon said, destruction is determined by time, but correction is determined by humans. The Rambam says something very similar in Hilfus Tshuva, the laws of repentance, chapter three, halacha four, look it up. Even though the sounding of the shofar Rosh Hashanah is a decree, remez yeshbo, it actually contains a hint, an illusion, kolomar. What is the hint that tkiat shofar contains? As follows, Uru Yesheni Mishnatchem, the Nir Damim Hakitsu Mitard Matchem. The shofar is calling out, Wake up, your sleep, you sleepy ones, from your sleep. And you who slumber, rise up, get up. And the Chizru Bitshuva, Vizichru Barachem, inspect your deeds, repent. Remember your Creator, Zichru Barachem. Elu Hashochachim et Aemet Bahavle Hazman. Those who forget the truth, and here's the quote Bahavle Hazman, in the passing of time, the Shogim, and here again, Kol Shunatam Behevel, 
throughout the year, they devote their energies to vanity, varik, and emptiness, which won't benefit them, it won't save them. Says the Rambam. Look to your souls. Improve your ways and your deeds. And let every one of you abandon his evil paths and his bad thoughts. The idea is very clear that the passing of time, Havle Hazman, and Kol Shenatam, which is spent Behevel Varik, can only be undone if you do Teshuvah, if you inspect your deeds, if you, your input changes who you are. As the Vilna Gaon said, without quoting the Rambam, destruction is determined by time. Havle Hazman, but correction is determined by humans. It is only if you are the one who does Teshuvah, if you're the one who takes action to improve yourself, that you can change matters. And that is why the mitzvot of Lot to are 365 compared to time, and the mitzvot Asay are compared to the parts of the human body, human action. So, what the Rambam, what the Vilna Gaon is say, are saying, is that time is an enemy. Do you know what your greatest enemy is? Time. So let's, just before I get to answering our five questions, let's just take a look at Rav Hutner again, the Pachad Yitzchak, to help us understand this fundamental concept expressed by the Vilna Gaon and alluded to in the Ramba. What is it about time that is so destructive and what is it that a human being can do to correct this destruction? A person's action, every action, is a new innovation. It's something new that the person has done and brought into the world. It is a creative force that brings something new at that second to the world. But the next second, it's already in the past. It's not new. It's not original. The essence of its creativity has been dulled by the passage of time. In Megillat Esther, we see a reference, Achashverosh turned to people known as, we just had Purim, right? They were known as Yodei Ha'itim, knowers of time. Achashverosh turned to them for advice. Who were they? The Maral explains that those who understand the effects of time always understand the secrets of life in this world. They understand how time impacts on any given situation and can even predict how time is going to affect the future. What does it say in Pirkei Avot? Ezul Chacham? Somebody who can see that which hasn't happened yet. Somebody who can anticipate the effects of time on a particular situation, set of circumstances, on himself, on his family, on his community. What is the impact of time? That is a chacham. They were the yodei ha'itim, the knowers of time that Achashverosh turned to in any given situation for advice. And this concept of the almost omnipotence of time on this world is so important for us to realize, to understand. It almost seems as if God himself is not in control. Time seems to be in control of everything and nothing is free of its effects. If you leave, think about this. Let's say you lock up a room in a house. You've all read books like this, right? Somebody closes off a room in a house, locks the door, and then forgets that the room exists and comes back to the room 10 years later. Or let's say we come back to the room. It's now 100 years later. And before they closed off the room, it was in perfect, in pristine condition. And they come back to the room 100 years later, what do you think the room is going to look like? 
It's not going to look perfect. It's not going to look pristine. It's going to be dusty and dirty. Things will have eroded over time. Time will have taken its toll. I once, many years ago, I read an article. Um, it was about the people who uh, colonized Africa, part of the Imperial British Empire. And they'd come to Africa and they built these magnificent homes in the middle of the, of the African jungle. Homes that could have been in Berkshire or in Sussex. And they built them in some godforsaken corner of Africa. And as you know, the British Empire eventually collapsed and they all went back off home to England. They had to leave these magnificent homes that they built. And now it was 50 or 80 years later and some photographer went to Africa to photograph all these beautiful, majestic mansions that had been built in Africa. And of course, the jungle had reclaimed them all. They were all full of vegetation and animals living there and birds had nested there. These beautiful homes, which still had, many of them had furniture, many of them had all the accoutrements that one would expect of a beautiful architectural mansion. But it was so many years later, time had taken its toll. And that's why the Rambam says that time obscures the truth. Because all we, although we know that God is in charge and that this is the ultimate truth, time seems to fly in the face of this truth to undermine it. The only antidote to time is human action. Humans can, to some extent, fight with time. How does a room remain clean despite time? How is that possible? Do you know how? Because a human being cleans it. It is an unequal battle. That's the truth. But any success against what time does is only going to be due to human effort. Had the whoever they were, those who had uh, settled as colonists in Africa, remained in those homes and you'd come back there 50 or 100 years later, those homes would still be in pristine condition. Why? Because a whole team of servants would have made sure that this home would be free of vegetation encroaching its way into the masonry and would be free of animals who lived there and birds nesting there. They would have made sure to keep the home in perfect condition. Time took its toll. Human beings could have reversed that. It is this combination of forces that will help us understand how time plays such an important role in the redemption, in Yitziat Mitzrayim, in the redemption from Egypt, and why everything had to happen in such a hurry. And with this concept, we can now begin to answer all five questions. I want to quickly repeat the five questions again. Um, so we can see how what we've learnt can help us answer them. So I'm going to go through them one by one, and then as I go through them, we'll answer each question until we get through to back to question number one. Let's start with the last one, with question number five. How exactly does the physical world function as a curtain, as a separation between humanity and God? So the answer is, the separation caused by the physical world comes about because it seems that time acts independently of God. And this illusion prevents us from sustaining contact with God. Even if we encounter God, we have a God moment. We have a spiritual revelation. It's amazing. And the next second, it's gone. Imagine you had a deep spiritual experience on Yom Kippur. The next day, it's not Yom Kippur anymore. You didn't have that experience right now. You had it yesterday. It's in the past. And this seems to be telling us that time is outside of God. We constantly need to find God. It's an illusion. And it prevents us getting close to God. Only in an eternal world, outside of the confines of time, can our relationship with God be constant, unfiltered, uninterrupted, uncontaminated. 
Time is a contaminator. It's a poison. It draws us away from God. So that's the curtain. But let's answer the fourth question. How is it possible for the passing of time to contaminate a mitzvah specifically? And the answer is quite simple. The more you allow a mitzvah to become the subject of elapsing time, the more you're removing the eternal aspect of the mitzvah that can only be realized at the very second that it became possible to do that mitzvah. Once the mitzvah is the subject to the control, is subjected to the control of time, and time has elapsed, the mitzvah becomes contaminated and impure. That's why we have to do a bris mila right away. Mitzvah, bo liyotcha, al tach mitzena. Let's get to it right away, because each minute that passes that you haven't done the mitzvah, time will have eroded that mitzvah. In the same way as each minute that you've allowed the dough to rise, that dough is turning into chametz. That's how matzah, a mitzvah, can be compared. The common denominator is that both Yetzias Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, and the performance of mitzvah, mitzvahs, involves the Jewish people. Yetzias Mitzrayim gave birth to the Jewish nation. We're only here because of that seminal moment in our history known as the exodus from Egypt. The performance of a mitzvah is the essence of a Jewish person, the Jewish people and a Jewish person. A mitzvah can only happen because you do it. It can't happen, it can't happen independently of you as a Jew. The mitzvah can only happen because you're Jewish and you're going to do it. Pachad Yitzchak says that ultimately a mitzvah is outside the boundaries of time. It's kind of an independent entity, we're claiming it. But because human beings are subjected to time, and only humans can bring a mitzvah into, into the world, a mitzvah is only able to be performed within that framework. There's no other way for a mitzvah to happen. Yes, mitzvahs pre-existed time and space, because the Torah pre-existed time and space. Whatever it is that a mitzvah represents, it can only be there because you do it. So that limitation is one that you've imposed on it. How do you draw that mitzvah out of the limitation? The only way you can do that is by doing it quickly and by doing it right away. Because if you do a mitzvah quickly, if you do it right away at the moment that it can be done, you will have, you will have drawn the mitzvah out of the limitations that are imposed on it by physical reality and you'll have elevated it into, into, into the terms of its spiritual, its original spiritual status. And this entire concept is derived from chipazon, from the idea of chipazon. The chipazon which accompanied Yitziat Mitzrayim. Since the Exodus is the beginning, the genesis of the Jewish people, and the genesis of the concept of Jewish collectiveness, which is a creation that is outside of the confines of time, it was necessary for the physical side of the redemption, the actual practical side of leaving, to happen in as short a time as possible. Yes, it was anticipated hundreds of years before. Abraham Avinu was told about it. Yitzhak was told about it. Yaakov was told about it. Everybody knew it was going to happen even as they were slaves in Egypt. But when it happened, it had to happen right away. It was not a mistake that the Exodus happened in a rush. It is the only way that it could have happened. The rush is an integral part of the redemption process. The Jewish people, the eternal Jewish people, whose very nature is metaphysical, were formed in a process that was outside the boundaries of time. The eternal peoplehood descended, as it were, into a physical world in a way that defied time. And they rushed out of Egypt. So too, when a mitzvah has to be done, when a mitzvah needs to be done, the time has come to do the mitzvah, to ascend from the physical world that we live in and to go up into the spiritual world, it must happen in defiance of time. Yetzias Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, 
and the performance of mitzvahs are in fact two sides of the same coin. So let's took a look at question number three. Why was the redemption so rushed, so disorganized? What was the reason for all the haste, for the hurry? Could God not have given us a few more minutes, hours, days? Let us pack up and do things and we could have had a nice sandwich as well with bread. But we've got the answer. The creation of a metaphysical nation can only happen with zrizut, uncontaminated by the parcel of time. That is exactly what the Exodus was about. And what about question number two? It seemed, when we first started the shir, that matzah is a completely irrelevant aspect of the Exodus narrative, like the Chagura, remember? So why is it the name of the festival? Why is it such a central motif? The answer is that it is a central motif because it represents the very essence of Yitziat Mitzrayim, of the Exodus, and of who we are as a nation. Our nationhood is not bound by the confines of time. We are beyond time. The Matzah exactly represents this concept. And this is why the festival in the Torah is referred to as Chag HaMatzot, not Chag HaChirut or Pesach or any of these other words that we might use. It's not the festival of nationhood. It's not Independence Day. It is represented by the matzah, the speed, the haste, the hurry that formed the backbone of our nation, of our national birth. Matzahs are the ultimate representation of what happened at Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And this is why the redemption was presented to Avram in people terms. Yes, there's 400 years. Of course, years elapsed. But it was Dora V.E. It was the fourth generation as it represented the first time that a group of people triumphed over time. What an incredible idea. And it also makes sense that the first mitzvah we were given at this time was the mitzvah of sanctifying time. What was the mitzvah we're given in Parshat Bo? Hachodesh hazeh lachem. You are given the opportunity of determining time. You create your calendar. You create your schedule. You are the ones, as the Vilna Gaon said, you are the ones who can beat destruction of time through human action. Now let's turn to the final question with which we began our share. Why specifically, with reference to dough not rising, is God referred to as Melech Malchei HaMalachim, the king of all kings? Why is this particular name for God used with reference to the Chippazon of Yitziat Mitzrayim? And the answer is that we need to stress that we, the Jewish people, are not servants to time, but rather we are servants of God. If we are servants of time, we're just the servants of a servant, because time is a servant of God. Although it seems that we are sometimes to us, we can think of ourselves as being the servants of time, we get older, time passes, we can't seem to help it, we've got no um, ability to control the passing of time, Sometimes we may even think that time is king because what choice do we have but to bow to time? Ultimately, however, time is a servant of God and therefore in the description of Yitziat Mitzrayim and the hastiness that accompanied it for all the reasons that we've already enumerated, the God of Yitziat Mitzrayim is described in terms that reflect the essence of the event being described. The Jewish people's formation came about outside of the realms of time because God is Melech Malachi Hamlachim. With that, I'd like to thank my very dear friend, Rabbi Yeshua Hartman in London, from whom most of the material in this shir is derived. His parish on the Maharal is, as many of you know, absolutely fantastic. His scholarship is exceptional. We went through this piece many, many years ago, and I'm delighted to repeat it and to cite his name and to thank him. 
for having shared many of the concepts in it with me. May we be zocha to a geula bechipazon in a great hurry and in great haste. Thank you all so much.